Hi, my name is Nick Walsh, and I'm a technical evangelist at Amazon Web Services. Uh, wanted to thank you for checking out this video. We've got some really exciting content lined up in the realm of AI and machine learning. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how you can build with AI without having ML experience. I promise you won't need a PhD to be able to put machine learning into action, uh, but I'll show you just what that means in a little bit. So first at AWS, I think it's important to understand our mission here. Uh, first and foremost, we understand that developers come in many shapes and sizes. And so to fulfill our mission of being able to put machine learning in the hands of every developer, we have to really understand the different developer types and developer stories. There's everything from a software engineer who may be a pro at writing code but may be new to machine learning. Conversely, there are people who are performing cutting edge academic work in the machine learning space but may not be as proficient with using open source and infrastructure oriented coding languages, paradigms, and frameworks. And so at AWS, our goal is to be able to release services that help and address the needs of all of these different developers and empower them to use machine learning. So as I mentioned before, more machine learning happens on AWS than anywhere else. And this is not accidental. This is actually by design. Um, I mentioned before that 85% of TensorFlow workloads that, workloads that happen in the cloud happen on AWS. Uh, this is because we've actually taken TensorFlow's underlying code uh, and optimized it to run on AWS's hardware and infrastructure, enabling con things like more efficient linear scaling. Ultimately, what this translates to is faster training times or cheaper costs for a given training workload. Uh, additionally, customers can leverage these familiar APIs that they've used for a lot of different frameworks in the past uh, in a more standardized format uh, with higher performance and scalability. Uh, but there's lots of other reasons why more machine learning happens on AWS than anywhere else, and it's also the breadth and depth of our services. But I'll, uh, I'll show you that right here. So uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the entirety of the stack, even though today's session is going to be focused on, this, on the uh, services that don't require machine learning expertise. Uh, so in order to achieve our mission, as mentioned before, of being able to put the power of machine learning in the hands of every developer, we've had to develop both broad with respect to the number of features for every type of developer, but deep as well with respect to being able to address everyone that uh, everything, everyone across the stack, whether you only know how to use an API and you're used to consuming those, to someone who wants to build a completely custom architecture or infrastructure from the ground up using some of the primitives. So at the bottom, uh, just like I talked about, the primitives, uh, we have we innovate down here, everything from being able to offer GPU instances and servers with the latest GPUs from NVIDIA, like Tesla V100s, uh, to FPGAs, Elastic Inference. These are core foundational services that will power some of the higher level, more abstracted services. Uh, additionally, if containers are more of your jam, we've, we uh, manage images for uh, a set set types of frameworks that are very common in machine learning workloads. So if you want to be able to take a machine learning AMI, uh, an Amazon machine image, uh, and be able to use that to perform your own custom workloads on a cluster or beyond, uh, you can you can rest uh, assured that those, those images are, are managed by AWS and we provide those, uh, and you'll know that those will work on AWS infrastructure. And lastly, uh, even at this, primi at this primitives level, all the way at the bottom, the foundational technology, uh, we have lots of cutting edge work even for uh, you know, custom types of deployment methodologies, for example, IoT. There are lots of instances where IoT devices may have limited connectivity to internet, may have reduced um, compute power, uh, or need to cycle the amount of uh, power they can consume at any one point in time based on maybe battery availability. Using tools like SageMaker Neo and IoT Greencast Machine Learning, this enables developers to actually take a model they've trained on the cloud and deploy it to the edge. Now, one step above that, we have uh, you know, the frameworks and interfaces and the platform services. And these sort of work hand in hand. So if, if users want to be able to write their own code or bring code they've already written in some of the most popular frameworks like CAFE, CNTK, MXNet, or most popularly TensorFlow, users can do that knowing that their code and the bindings they've used in the open source variants will work on AWS. Again, you can use open source variants and, and builds of this code on AWS infrastructure, but we actually have ways of leveraging this in a more optimized fashion in SageMaker, which I'll get to in just a moment. This 
above the frameworks and interfaces, we have the platform services. Uh, and when we think about this category, this really comes down to the fact that we need to build a tool for developers uh, who don't want to deal necessarily with the underlying primitives, but want to be able to achieve machine learning value from end to end. Uh, and we know that this starts really early on in the pipeline, everything from being able to gather and label your training set to the point where you're deploying your model into production so that it can serve requests, either externally if you're trying to vend an API as a service, if that's what your organization does, or internally to other parts of your application to serve recommendations, perform analysis on, on data, so on and so forth. Uh, and SageMaker is our platformized approach to do that. So it is, again, a, uh, a purpose-built end-to-end platform from building, training, and deploying your model. Now, lastly, if users don't want to be able to do that, if they, if they don't need to build their model from scratch, if they don't need to train using their own custom data, or they don't want to manage any of the infrastructure around this or deploying their model, we have what are called the, applic the AI services. Uh, this is essentially the highest level of abstraction, and this is the most generalizable tool set that can be used for, for companies and organizations that have these use cases. So there are a handful of them. The first I'll talk about is vision. Uh, this entails anything that involves visual data, so images and video. Uh, we see here Amazon recognition image and video as well as text track to extract forms. I won't go too deep into any of these right now because I'll go into each of them later on in the presentation. Next we have speech, anything that has to do with audio data. We have Amazon Poly which will enable you to take text and convert it to audio. Uh, that's really handy for things like um, vocalizing a blog post, for example. And then transcribe, which will allow you to take audio and actually uh, transcribe that and have a text output uh, from that given audio file. Next, we move on to language. Uh, everything from the common task of being able to translate from one source language to a destination language. Uh, and then comprehension, another very common uh, use case or, or, or type of work that you want to do around language or text. And this is going to enable you to do things like sentiment analysis on the text or picking out key entities uh, and understanding more about your textual data. Lastly, we have some of the newer features. Uh, everything from Amazon Lex from chatbots to time series forecasting with Amazon Forecast. And lastly, personal recommendations. You want to be able to serve personal content that is reflective of prior actions and, and data that your customers, that you have from your customers or your users. And Amazon Personalize enables you to do that. Uh, again, these are all a class of services at the highest level of abstraction. They require the least amount of machine learning expertise because all of these models are actually built, crafted, and tuned by machine learning researchers and scientists here at AWS. Uh, essentially, you don't need to manage any of the underlying infrastructure, which is one of the benefits of these managed services. And you can consume the uh, API by sending your data to it and pay on a per request basis, which is much, very similar to any other sort of API that you may consume uh, for other vendors. Now, again, talking uh, about the AI services, these are a lot of points that are very similar to things I've just spoken about. But I really want to harp on the fact that you don't need any machine learning skills or training here. I mentioned before, you can do powerful function, achieve powerful functionality with things like uh, computer vision. But you don't need to actually understand anything about computer vision because the entry point is, again, an API. You can easily send your data either in the form of an S3 URL or the bytes of the actual image itself to the API and get the results for everything from the labels in the image to the bounding boxes for faces. Uh, and this, this, this paradigm is consistent for all of the other APIs as well. Next, this is very quick and easy to go to market with. So uh, when it comes to building an application or a feature set, we hear loud and clear how important it is to be able to not just achieve the functionality that you want, but to be able to do so quickly. With the fact that there's no machine learning required, you don't have to manage any of the infrastructure, and these are available off the shelf, we are very confident that developers who are already comfortable using APIs can help your organization build out these feature sets that you want very quickly. And lastly, quality and accuracy is something that's very important to us. Uh, we want to be able to offer models that are offering state-of-the-art performance with respect to accuracy and all of the different functionalities that they'll achieve. And as a result, when, model, when these services are launched, uh, that is not the finite version uh, of the service or of the model that you will uh, have access to for the life cycle of, of you being a consumer of that of that product. And what I mean by that is that if a service launched in 2016 or 2017, uh, there are iterative updates that are actually made to those models by Amazon uh, and AWS machine learning engineers. And you don't get charged for those updates. So when you're trying to perform a TCO or total cost analysis um, of um, 
or total cost opportunity of this entire venture of, of choosing an off-the-shelf API example, you're not just vending the per request um, functionality there, you're actually investing in the fact that these APIs will be improved over time and that you can rest assured that you will continuously have a state-of-the-art example and model. Now, when I talk about these generalizable solutions and these continuous uh, uh, you know, classes of problems like computer vision, speech, translation, and so on, uh, a lot of folks and companies think that AI uh, or their AI problem is actually unique to their business. And uh, you know, while every company's mission is to solve a problem for a set of customers in a very unique and specific way, that doesn't always mean that your AI or machine learning problem is necessarily unique to their business. Uh, so, you know. Spoiler alert, it probably isn't. Um, but you, know, you don't have to believe me, because I'll show you a few examples, and hopefully you'll agree with me. So let's talk about one use case here. I'm going to dive deep on, on a physical document story uh, about how trying to extract information from documents is a really hard problem. Uh, this is something that you probably face, regardless of what field or vertical or segment you're in. Uh, and so the analogy will extend to lots of the other features and services that we'll see down the line. But I want to take this story from end to end so that we can actually see what this looks like to use an off-the-shelf API for what could seem like a very convoluted problem. Now, in this example, we're going to talk a little about forms uh, for US tax code. Uh, and there's reasons why this isn't a really exciting example. Uh, so obviously, if you live in the United States, uh, you pay taxes in some form or another. Uh, so there were 16.3 million US mortgage applications uh, in 2016. Um, and so mortgage is, is, is one example. But this represents $2.1 trillion for a single use case. right? So there's a lot of money, clearly, even if it's not just for one company, in being able to better understand or more efficiently process documents. Uh, and, and to go back to the tax example here, there were over 240 million W-2 forms that are processed back in fiscal year 2018 in the US. And this is an example or a, a little bit of a, a sample of what some of those W-2 forms may look like. So today, before if we want to like start looking where we can improve this, uh, this is done manually. Uh, that's obviously the standard in many, in many instances. Uh, this is slow. You have the ability of humans to be able to double, triple check, let's say. Um, but again, that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Next, we have optical character recognition, or OCR. Uh, this is one of the leading ways of attempting automation for processing documents. Uh, this is a, a class of uh, functionality and software that enables you to actually extract the, the characters and the words and the sentences on a page. Uh, there's some drawbacks to a lot of the common implementations of this, but this is a first step in actually being able to automate the extraction of data from, let's say, uh, physical documents or, or printouts, for example. And then lastly, we have rules and template-based extraction. So if we assume that OCR is generalizable, where I can feed any document in and assume it'll return all of the text, uh, a rules and template-based extraction assumes that for a given document, I know that for certain parts of the page, uh, maybe within certain pixel bounds will be uh, form A uh, for name, for example. So I can then extract any of the text within pixel boundary for form A, and that will be the first name for a candidate. Um, you know, this can be powerful if you have a very firm and, and um, a consistent form experience and template. But this is also brittle, because any time uh, you have, let's say, an imperfection in how a document is scanned, a lot of these rules break down. Uh, further, it, it can completely stifle your ability to actually alter that form. Or even worse, you do alter that form, and it entirely breaks your automation system. So these are three of the primary ways documents are processed today, but they're not necessarily perfect. So we're looking at a zoom in on, on one of the different fields of a uh, of one of the, the forms here. And to, to add a little flavor as to how this could all be even more difficult, we have the fact that there's a pretty solid uh, amount of inconsistency in how certain forms are processed or in how certain forms exist out in the wild. So here, as we can see, we have uh, multiple boxes uh, that are seemingly chained together. And in the first uh, box we see there on the left, there is what appears to be a check mark in there. Uh, so you know this can be actually pretty challenging. Uh, to, to, to try and ascertain in a consistent manner what this really means. Now, the, the, the intuitive solution here is that uh, exempt is true um, for uh, this first category, which is, you know, it could be 28, it could be RPC, it could be RRQ, it could be any of these different outputs here, right? I don't have domain expertise into this type of tax form or this form, um, but Honestly, any of these given examples could be a reasonable output. And this is where things uh, start to really pan out with respect to humans uh, and, and being imperfect and, and difficulty in processing some of this form data. 
So there's variable output, inconsistent results, and you may need multiple people to double check to confirm that everyone's behaving the way you think in a labeling job. OK, so I mentioned OCR. It's really great in that it helps to extract text from a page, but it's not perfect. So the first reason it's not perfect is because it probably is only going to work best for simple documents. And what I mean by this is that uh, OCR is designed uh, or is by design going to essentially scrape the pixels across your given document and try to extract at each uh, given area or bounding region on your document certain text, whether it be individual characters or entire words at a time, or you know, extrapolate that even further to sentences. Uh, this is really great, but let's say you have documents that don't have perfectly perpendicular sort of uh, fields. Let's say you have, um, let's say, uh, you know, you have fields that are really tight. You have words that need to go beyond certain sections. So if you have a uh, like an address bar and your true address is longer than the actual number of spaces they allot you for bounding boxes, this can be problematic for OCR. It's error prone in that uh, it is simply trying to look at each pixel in what is near isolation uh, to try to extrapolate uh, these underlying characteristics, which we want to uh, view, which are going to be the letters and the words. Um, you know. One view of this is that it's uh, you know, not instituting some sort of bias, which could exist in a templated example. Um, but the other side of that is that it's not able to use any of the context around it to be able to have a more accurate result. Uh, and then lastly, we have the flat bag of words uh, problem where if we're looking for individual uh, types of words or we're looking for predefined notions of what words and letters can look like, it can be really difficult to try and improve our OCR to account for new characters or account for permutations of characters that may not have been in our OCR training set, for example. Uh, now, as we can see, uh, if we were to run OCR on an example like this, there's another challenge that presents itself. I mentioned before that OCR tries to scrape the pixels on the screen and typically takes some sort of naive approach. In this example, left to right. Uh, for English text, this is an extremely common pattern because that's how humans read and write uh, in the English language. And so here, we see a two-column example where this starts to break down. So on the left column, we see TextTrack makes it easy to quickly and accurately extract data. But then on the right, we see TextTrack's pre-trained machine learning models eliminate the need. Now, we as humans can really easily see that these are two columns and that we should read them as such in accordance to whatever our given language is. Um, but here, in naive OCR examples, they will simply read from left to right across the page and return text that is in no way valuable to us because you are now crossing the two columns. Uh, lots of printed media involved this sort of format and beyond, and I hope you can see how dicey things get very quickly. So no multi-column detection in off-the-shelf OCR examples, no rotated text. Uh, let's say things could be vertical or even just on any sort of angle. Um, and stylized font detection becomes very difficult because the training set is typically on as standard of a font size uh, as possible. OK, next. So you thought I was done with columns, right? No, there's more, there's more wrenches that get thrown in the mix in, in data out in the wild. Uh, and one of those is actually tables. So we're used to seeing spreadsheets oftentimes on our computer. But the honest truth is that a lot of times these get printed out in the documents that we use. Uh, and the annotation uh, and the uh, Transcription of tables is, is often an equally slow uh, and laborious process. And so this is a pretty standard table. We've got a bunch of columns with certain headers, uh, and we have values for each of the different entries within this table. So if we were to run OCR on this type of example, it may ignore the lines because the lines in the table are not actually characters like it's trained on. Uh, and it will, again, return, hopefully, the text for all of this given table. But there's no sort of um, you know, semantic layout to it. It will simply return the blob of text uh, from left to right. And then once it finishes a given line or, or area of the screen, it will move on to the next item. And uh, we'll return that as such. Uh, again, it's valuable in that we may have the raw text from this image. Uh, but we do want to be able to search on individual stru on structure inside of the table, because that's exactly why we have data in a table to begin with. So we may solve the problem halfway, um, but we think we can do a little bit better than that. So left to right ignores table structure. OK. And if there weren't enough challenges in OCR documents, uh, we have this monstrosity, which is probably far more common than we'd all like to admit, where we have what seem to be completely custom and arbitrary sort of tables and fields. Uh, we have everything here from lines with keys underneath, where people fill in the value on top. Um, we have uh, a radio button all the way on the right. Uh, there's 
arbitrary date of birth ha includes, you know, what can appear to be in isolation strange keys like MM, DD, YYYY, which is trying to infer the format, but not necessarily the key, which would be year, uh, month, day, year. Uh, so this is this is really challenging, but this actually happens out in the wild. And so, uh, you know, again, naive OCR will pull out all the text effectively. But is this actually going to be able to give us the input and or the the keys and values that we want? And the honest answer is no. Um, we want to be able to group our keys and our values. Uh, when we read left to right in this example, that is completely missed out on, uh, and glyphs are missed. So. Like I said before, OCR is only as good as the training data you have fed it. And so if that is standard alphanumeric characters uh, for, let's say, the English alphabet, um, you do not have the ability to detect glyphs, like in this example, a filled radio button. Uh, and then that data gets completely missed by OCR. And you don't get necessarily a um, notification that it was missed. You know, the transcription will, uh, the OCR will happen just as it is, and it will probably completely miss out on that category, which is problematic, especially when you're trying to automate things. OK, lastly, we have templates. Uh, so again, I mentioned before that uh, templates are sort of a modified version of OCR, where you're essentially taking uh, the benefit of OCR, which is the ability to recognize text, and you're bounding it in certain uh, regions and areas of your resulting real live data based on assumptions you're making about that data for one reason or another. Let's say you have one standard type of form that you know should come in all of the time. This can be great. Um, but you actually have to have someone manually write out all of those rules and policies, which is very time consuming and requires a lot of testing. Lastly, they're brittle, as I spoke to prior. Uh, this either will prevent you from being able to modify your forms going forward, um, or you modify your form and your automation breaks, neither of which are a great place to be. Uh, and we think we can get around that. Beauty of machine learning is that we can feed it lots of really interesting training data so that it can ascertain what these rules are in real time. So hopefully we have a solution for that. And you know, I said before, maybe you can assume that you have one standard version of a file. Uh, with the W2 form in the United States, you may assume that that actually takes one standard form, but that's honestly not the case. All of the different examples here that I've listed are actually uh, essentially analogous forms of the same keys and values. So uh, the same values, that the same data that they need to know, folks would fill that in, sometimes in varying different forms. So for even a single document that's sent to a single organization, we find that regardless of what works in theory, in practice, this is what our data collection and storage often looks like in documents out in the wild. And so if we want to actually take the templating approach here, as I mentioned before, like. Uh, narrowing in on certain regions and expecting certain keys there, we find that not a single corresponding pixel value uh, is the same between these filled out versions of these documents. Uh, and so when I say that you know it, these these templates are brittle or these templates um, you know are, are extremely manually curated, which takes time and money, uh, this is this is the testament to that, right? This is the same form in four different slightly modified formats um, with with you know different user input that. Res respond with completely different raw data from pixel perspective, which makes OCR and templating pretty limited in accuracy. OK, so I just talked to you a lot about why documents are hard. Uh, and thankfully, I'm here to talk a little bit also about Amazon Textract. It's our purpose-built solution for performing OCR++. Essentially, you can take any document, and virtually any document, and extract the data necessary in some sem form of semantically valuable um, you know, structure. Uh, this is this aims to solve the problems that I spoke about before. And the best part of all is that you don't actually need any machine learning experience to be able to get off the ground using this. I spoke previously about how our models are consistently updated. And we've actually had uh, a fairly recent update to the text tract model under the hood as well. And I have a link to that here. You can check that out and actually see what the machine learning scientists have improved from the previous version. So. Let's focus in a little bit on Textract here for a moment. So Textract has a handful of key features that make it really exciting. First is going to be text extraction. Uh, this is going to enable you to, in a very dynamic and robust way, extract the text, uh, again, without needing to formulate manual policies uh, around what form your document is in before you feed it to Textract. Next is the ability to have table extraction. As I mentioned prior, the fact that our data is laid out in a very particular manner in a table is semantically valuable to us. And we want to be able to automate the acquisition of that data and logging that digitally. Uh, we want to automate that as much as possible. And Textract enables us to do that. 
Then last we have form extraction. This is a bit of the wild west where uh, the biggest hole up uh, typically in the past is the fact that forms can be extremely diverse in what they look like. Uh, Textract does a really good job of being able to handle a lot of different arbitrary types of inputs um, with respect to keys and values. So for example, radio buttons um, and, and, and lots, of different, uh, lots of different input fields that I'll show you in a little bit. Okay, first with Textract, what you can expect to get out as output of, of a given query. So here we have a document on the left. Uh, extending the example from before, we have two columns. We want to be able to obviously have this uh, in proper, accurate format. So uh, let's just take the left-hand side for a second, the left-hand block. So this is uh, the first set of uh, responses, or this first block that we will see, essentially, from Textract. Um, we'll get into what a block is in just a moment. But within this block, what we can see is it contains a few things. It has metadata around the fact that there are given words in a given block. There is a line which is going to represent some sort of continuous uh, sequence of words. Again, notice that may not be exactly on a horizontal plane. That could be on an angle as well. Um, this can be part of a paragraph, so it can automatically detect where indentation occurs. Uh, and then lastly, one of the things that failed before with OCR is the fact that this isn't a column. So Textract can actually use that white space that exists simply from the pixels on the page from a scanned document and ascertain where certain columns are and paragraphs and lines to be able to then uh, return to you data that is properly formatted without needing to have manual curation. So again, you feed in the document. And what this means is that you are calling an H, uh, a REST API. You are passing in, in this case, uh, either a PDF or an image of this document. So there is no labeled semant uh, there is There are no la labeled aspects of the text in this image. It is nothing but pixels. Um, and, and essentially, what Textract will output here is going to be a, a a uh, blob of JSON that will cont contain the blocks for the text, uh, will contain concepts such as the paragraph, the line, the word, and so on. Uh, with that data, you can do as you please, which is, again, the entire purpose here. Automate the collection and labeling of, of your data, um, or annotation of your data, rather, uh, so that you can then start using that data to be searchable or to be able to order things or what have you. That's what your business is supposed to focus on. OK, so uh, if, you know you want to dig into the weeds a little bit here of each of these, uh, of the given response here. Uh, again, the input or the request is going to be a document that can be a blob of bytes from the client or for whoever is making the request, or an S3 object. Um, we'll get into use cases where S3 object upload as an event trigger is really helpful. Um, but for now, you know, just know that you have the option to use either. Then on the response side, you're going to return blocks. Uh, blocks can be a list of blocks, so they can be self-encapsulated. Example of this would be that the entire line for the sentence is a block, but contained within that, you will actually have uh, a block for each given word or um, set of glyphs, let's say, for example, if you're looking at some sort of math equation, let's say. Uh, you'll have a unique ID, you'll have relationships, uh, block type, and, and pages. Es essentially, uh, pages will handle uh, one single Textract API call can actually handle a multi-page document. So you can uh, you don't have to feed in each image separately. You can feed in an entire document or a blob of bytes, uh, and the metadata for the, the page number will be encapsulated in the response. OK, so that's detecting text. And that's actually the underpinnings for some of the other downstream features like uh, analyzing documents, which we see right here, uh, and then after that, forms. So we have analyze document as a method in, in Amazon Textract, uh, and table is one of the feature types that you can specify as a parameter. So on the left-hand side, let's say we have a document. It has a x by y relational table. Um, and what we want to get out of this is the, uh, the entirety of the page. You want to get the bounding box for the table and the respective data within it. And then each Textract is actually trained to be able to ascertain data for each of the cells in their respective um, ordering, which is, again, very important. So for each block that you'll be getting for your table, or, or for each block, which will probably be each cell in this example, you'll be getting uh, the text for within that cell, the confidence score for how confident Textract is in that being the exact form of the text as it appears. Maybe it's off by a letter, so it may lose some confidence. Uh, and then lastly is going to be block relationships. Again, very important for tables. Understanding where each of these blocks lays with respect to one another so that you could, for example, run a query to analyze a document and then very easily parse the JSON to retrieve all of the values for a given column in a, in a relational table. So if we feed this in, what we'll see here uh, for the W2 
tax form for analyze document, we'll get some different things, right? We had a, a lot of different keys and values in this type of example. They don't always line up uh, as closely as they do in a standard sort of spreadsheet format. So for each block here, we may get everything from uh, trying to understand what the key is. So for example, if it says name with a colon and then um, you know a blank space next to it, TextTract would likely return that the form field uh, or the key will be name and the value. So if I filled in my name, which is Nick, uh, hopefully it would be able to have that match. And it will return that in, again, standard semantic JSON. On. It'll give you the confidence score for that, uh, the page number, and any of the relationships of those blocks to one another. So that again, you can take action contingent on the confidence of this result. Uh, Textract is by no means perfect for every single crazy and wild form that you can imagine out there. But knowing the confidence of the prediction for each of these different blocks makes it really easy for you to be able to determine what documents Textract is very confident in and that it's uh, returning, hopefully, uh, accurate and proper results, and knowing preemptively whether that should get a second look from someone else or whether um, you know this form is there's something else that's wrong with the form that prevents it from being read easily. All available from the confidence scores. OK, this is available in both synchronous and asynchronous uh, method formats. So uh, let's say we have one situation. We have a document. We want to be able to feed it into Amazon Textract, and we automatically get the results. So this will support single page documents. Let's say this is an image. I've taken a scan of a you know, or, or a picture from my phone of a single document. Um, what I can basically do here is I take the document, I feed it to Textract, and uh, the the actual trend, the uh, the OCR, the, the process that happens under the hood, uh, happens, and and as such, it will synchronously return a, a response for the results of that call. So in a single HTTPS uh, API request, it will both we will both send the document and receive the results. Now, in an asynchronous fashion, we can actually have a document of a variable size. This could be multi-page documents um, all the way up to, I believe, 3,000 pages is the limit currently. And so we can send that to Textract. And what that will actually return in the asynchronous methodology will be a uh, transcription job in the location where that result will live. Uh, and so what we can do based on that is then have a notification for when that transcription job is done, and then we can asynchronously return those results. So we can kick off that process to start that transcription job and have our code be doing other things in the meantime. Uh, this is, again, really valuable so that you don't have to make a, uh, like HTTPS, API calls will time out uh, if you have um, you know, a really, really long document that could take a very long time to return. So the asynchronous methodology uh, just simply gives you more granularity and durability in um, building applications on this sort of functionality. OK, so again, let's go back to this example. Uh, if we were to run this two-page, uh, you know, two-column two page through Textract, uh, what would it return? So uh, this works. It would return multi-column detection. It, use, it analyzes the blocks, and it'll give us the semantic mapping to know that there's uh, all the data on the left-hand side is in column one, and we can group and filter by that. Uh, and all of the data on the right-hand side will be in column two, again, solving the problem that standard OCR uh, does this. And we don't have to actually hard code this into Textract. Again, no machine learning knowledge necessary. We have built Textract as a generalizable tool to be able to accomplish this so that you can just get off the ground and using it right away. It's an API call. You don't manage any of that underlying infrastructure. You start using it very quickly, and you don't have to manage any of that underlying science or machine learning model. Let's look at, again, uh, Textract uh, in use with this table. So again, we have columns like start date, end date, employer name, and so on. What would we expect to see here? Well, we want the table to be recognized. We want the words to be grouped by cell. Uh, and so this would look like something along the lines of this. Uh, so you see here you have a bunch of keys and values. If you're used to handling JSON, this is, uh, this is, this is very helpful because, again, you, you can use whatever bindings in your language of choice are to easily parse this. Um, but you don't have to write custom code to be able to extract it, which is, again, helping you deliver uh, value to your company and your customer. So we see start date and the value for that. We have end date and the value for that. Uh, and this, again, works with numbers, works with letters, um, and all of the things that we see here on this table. But you know that's definitely not all. So let's go back to the really hairy case that we looked at before, which is this very arbitrary form abstraction. Uh, if you had to write a custom template for being able to identify the data in this sort of format, maybe you could do it. It involves a lot of deep understanding of exactly what this form is trying to do. And oftentimes, some of the keys here may actually be, uh, as represented on the form, different from what the key may be in, a, um, you know, in, your, in your data set or if you were to digitally log this. So it becomes very difficult. 
Uh, now, if we run this through Textract, again, I mentioned before, uh, writing policies and, and, and templating is very brittle, and, and glyphs don't necessarily get detected. Um, but this is what this would return if you if you analyzed this uh, form through Textract. So we have all the logical groupings returned. So despite the key for na first name and middle and last name being underneath a line, uh, we see that that has you know. Uh, properly mapped to full name as the core root of the block with first, middle, and last as uh, you know subsections of that given block, uh, and the given key value pairings for each of them. Uh, same thing extends onto date of birth uh, and gender in the final column, where we see that there is a true value for the filled in radio button and false for the uh, unfilled one. So very, very valuable, again, available off the shelf. Talking to a customer example that I mentioned before, uh, Cox Automotive uses this to process documents at scale. Uh, so there, Cox Automotive is a collection of digital brands uh, that helps to bridge the gap between consumers, manufacturers, dealers, and lenders at every stage in the process. And as you can imagine, with all of those different properties I just named, they deal with a lot of documents. Uh, so everything from vehicle titles, loan applications, car registrations. And by leveraging Amazon Textract, they can accelerate these transactions, enable people to um, confirm purchases, to be able to sell vehicles, uh, and to be able to ultimately close these transactions much, much, much quicker, uh, which is uh, quicker and cheaper, which is uh, two value propositions that I don't think many companies would say no to. OK, so what does using this look like in practice? And again, I know I'm going very deep on a document use case. I'll get to some demos for the other services in a little bit and talk to each of them. But I wanted to go through this end to end because a lot of the learnings that we have here for one use case actually apply across all of the other AI services. So I promise we'll get to the other ones, and it'll all be valuable, even if you're not processing a lot of documents. So first, we have the input. So the uploaded document in this example could be a PDF. It could be an image. Um, credit card applications, medical notes, whatever your vertical is. Uh, let's say you upload this to Amazon S3, our uh, very standard form of, of storing files, a very, very common use case, uh, storing it on there. And so one of the benefits of storing items on S3 is that you can actually set an event trigger for something called an AWS Lambda. If you're not familiar with it, it's essentially uh, cloud serverless functions that don't require managing any of the infrastructure. And so they can spin up on a given event. In this example, that would be the uploading of a given document. So you upload the document to S3, it will trigger an AWS Lambda. Within that AWS Lambda code, again, it may just be a simple function. You can call out to Amazon Textract. You did not need to provision anything with Textract. You did not need to um, know the IP addresses. You can simply use whatever your SDK of choice is, instantiate a Textract client, and pass in the necessary parameters in this form a document and what type of uh, analysis you want done on it, either a key or, or a text document or table. Um, and then you get the output. So that output may be all of those blocks that we talked about before. Uh, you know, it, it will return all of that. Now it's up to you to figure out what you want to do with that. Uh, in an example where maybe we want to have some sort of fuzzy searching ability based on all of these documents that we're scanning, you can upload those to Amazon Elasticsearch service and be able to use that to actually parse all of the output from JSON and you can store that data directly in your Elasticsearch service. So end to end, uh, a completely uh, a serverless example of being able to upload uh, data, process it using Lambda and Textract, and then output it for the uh, ability to achieve search. The next, let's say you want to be able to simply store this in a database to be used in other parts of your application, another really common use case. So you have the input. The customer is going to, let's say, use your mobile app to capture a picture of their tax form or some other form. Uh, the actual mobile application can call directly to the Textract API um, and return that data to them directly. So let's say they take a picture, and then you can have a smart scan feature that actually autofills all of the fields on their mobile device. And that enables the user to actually uh, correct if any of those examples could be wrong. So you bypass needing to have someone at your own organization double checking that. But again, customers would love that experience because it makes filling out and logging a form much simpler than having to manually enter all of that data. And then lastly, once the customer has confirmed all of that, let's say you save that data into the database uh, that's used for other account management and other functionalities that your customer will want. Uh, extraction for NLP, I'll go through this one really quickly. Uh, essentially, you input a document, upload to S3. Um, you can use a Lambda to automatically uh, trigger Textract to extract those words and those lines of text. You can then perform some sort of natural language processing on those documents. An example before, if you want to go for the full AI services suite, would be Amazon Comprehend. So let's say you process reviews that are filled out in a form after a, a um, 
after an event in person or something. And then with Comprehend, you can actually ascertain what those sentiment that the sentiment were, are people happy, are they upset? You can put that into Amazon Elasticsearch service um, and you, know, you can then search that. In this case here on the slide, we have examples in the medical space um, to understand maybe the patient feedback uh, life cycle. So if people are on their way out of the hospital, they fill out forms, you can use this to automate the process of understanding how people are feeling at your hospital. Uh, but really the, the root of all of the processing here, the heavy legwork where you would have to build this from start to finish is going to be in you know the, those two core services in the beginning. You are now going from essentially in those two blocks uh, an input of a saved file which is stored on S3 in, in the cloud, um, or just an image, a bunch of pixels, and you are actually after feeding it through two APIs that are very standard. Um, you're actually ending up with actionable insights. Now, where you put those and what you do with that is up to you. Uh, but by just using AI APIs that are off the shelf, that don't have to be trained uh, by you or, or have any ML expertise to leverage, uh, this becomes really easy to uh, go to market with features for your customers. All right, so I promised I'd get to all the other AI services, so we're going to power through them now. Again, thank you for sticking through that deep dive on, on documents. Uh, but to a different note, in still the visual space, we have Amazon Recognition. So this is a deep learning based image and video analysis tool that enables you to do everything from detecting labels in an image and objects, as we see here in this example. Uh, but you can detect faces and sentiment uh, of, of different objects or faces, colors, so on. There, there are a lot of different methods that are available for users. Um, I spoke about a bunch of them, but here are uh, some of those with uh, pictures paired up with them. Uh, you also have the ability to moderate content, so return like not safe for work flags if certain content is, uh, you want to preempt that before it's shown on certain sites or, or parts of your application. Uh, activities, there's a lot of richness in labels that tech, that recognition will return. Uh, and the idea is that you, know, you have pictures, you have images, you have vi videos, this is the data that you have, and we want to help you unlock the value of that without needing to learn machine learning. And recognition enables you to do that over an API. Now, a customer that does exactly this would be IAA Credit. They use recognition to analyze images, to, analyze, to verify a uh, customer's identity, um, whether it's for, let's say, a banking app or being able to uh, provide loans in a quicker and more verifiable process. Um, all very, very interesting use cases. Um, but ultimately, again, the trend here is remove the undifferentiated heavy lifting, prevent you from needing to learn machine learning AI to be able to implement it in your applications. OK, on to speech and language services. So we want you to discover insights and relationships in your text. First, we have Amazon Polly. Uh, Amazon Polly, uh, kind of like its name in, uh, in Sue, is uh, you take text and you're able to actually synthesize audio from this. Very valuable for content creation if you want to auto, uh, auto generate audio that from a script that you have, or maybe you have a blog post that you want to be able to vocalize. Very, very valuable. Um, there's lots of different examples of this. We'll actually go into a demo in a little bit, so I won't sit too long on this. But essentially, one of the top level features that I want you to be able to understand is that there are 61 unique voices across 25 different languages. And because, again, this uses deep learning under the hood, we've designed it in such a way where it can work natively with each of those given uh, like mother tongues for that given language. So if you uh, type English into an English voice speaker, it should return English in uh, whichever you chose, so either like British English um, you know, US English or, or Australian English. Um, and, and then for other languages as well, uh, you can natively return uh, semantically correct uh, pronunciations for those given languages. You can set custom vocabularies, and it's available very widely. Uh, Polly was launched back in 2016, so it's one of the older AI services. It's been around for a while. Next, we have Amazon Transcribe. And as its name assumes, you can actually take audio data and transcribe it into text automatically. Um, so essentially, what this looks like from a user's perspective is you, or from a developer's perspective, is you're passing in, uh, the, again, a byte stream of, of audio uh, data, or you're passing in an S3 URI. And from that, you'll return the transcript for that given audio. Uh, so we have everything from regular telephony audio, timestamps, punctuation and formatting, even custom dictionaries. If you work and are processing audio where certain words may not be common in the standard language of, uh, you know, uh, that you're using, you can actually define custom dictionaries to improve the accuracy around detecting those words so that you can cut down on the custom processing, post-processing code that you need to write. Uh, Transcribe is available in two primary formats. It's going to be both in streaming, so real time. As you're speaking, you have a WebSocket connection open that's returning the, the words as they're coming in. And then batch, where you can, similarly to the synchronous, asynchronous nature of Textract, send videos upwards of hours long and get back uh, in an efficient fashion a, the results of that transcription job. 
use cases here that are really common that we've found use in call centers, auto-generating subtitles for VODs, uh, closed captions for real-time streaming. So let's say you don't have on-demand content or something is being streamed live uh, with transcriptions, Amazon Transcribe streaming service that enables you to actually have real-time captions for that, which is really cool and valuable. And last time, uh, lastly, uh, automation of things that people may not be doing or could be onerous and, and time consuming, like transcribing the audio of your meetings to auto-generate notes. Great, next we have Amazon Translate. Uh, Amazon Translate, again, very aptly named. It's going to enable you to take text from one source language and translate it to uh, text in another destination language. It also has automated uh, language detection built in. So if you uh, pass in a given piece of text, it can you can tell Translate and not specify what language is, and it will try to auto-detect what that language uh, is. And then you still have to define the destination language. It's really easy to use. Um, it can understand styling and formatting. Again, this is not some sort of direct one-to-one -one mapping of word in language A means word in language B. Uh, this uses, again, uh, you know, deep learning under the hood to be able to perform and have what are semantically correct translations in those languages. Uh, if you're a speaker or you're multilingual, if you're a speaker of multiple languages or you're multilingual, uh, it's typically very common when you see folks that have tried to plug in words one by one when you translate. The idea, again, for tran Amazon Translate is to be able to have this be as accurate as possible for native, uh, for native utilization. It's very cheap to use. You can uh, use up to, um, it's uh, $15 per 1 million characters. Uh, and lastly, it's fast. So for a given sentence, that may only take 500 milliseconds. Uh, and if you have really, really quick short form text, like which is common in, in let's say, instant messaging sort of applications, uh, could be less than 150 milliseconds for short form text. Obviously, data security is very important. Security is priority zero at AWS. Uh, concepts like data ownership, encryption, and access management are all available when it comes to Translate. And this is what allows us to be HIPAA eligible. Uh, obviously, what this means is that uh, when customers leverage the proper um, precautions with respect to using the service in a way that is compliant with HIPAA eligibility or, or, or HIPAA compliance, uh, then they can achieve that again. Uh, the service is only as compliant as um, you know you can make it, but we have achieved everything that we need to on our end to ensure that that's the case for you. Next, we have Comprehend. I've spoken about this a little bit earlier, but this is going to enable you to get insights from your text, text data. Everything from sentiment. Is it positive, negative, neutral, or mixed? Uh, important entities. Can we extract the key nouns or the key verbs from a given passage? Comprehend enables us to do this. Are there key phrases? So in a given paragraph, is there a su certain subject that keeps reappearing um, in certain ways that may have pronouns where, we, where Comprehend can actually ascertain that this given proper noun, a person by name, and the word he uh, appearing multiple times, uh, presumably in reference to that person, that can, Comprehend can extract that. It's very valuable. Next, we have languages. You can automatically detect what the language may be. Uh, now, I mentioned before you could do text tract into comprehend to understand the sentiment of visual documents, right? Well, let's flip that around a little bit, right? We can actually use comprehend to power translate's auto language detection. That's actually how translate's auto detection work feature works under the hood. Uh, this is what I mean before when I talked about how the foundational services sort of power the ones above it, the higher levels of abstraction. Uh, comprehend's language detection is so strong that we actually use it to power um, translates language detection. And then lastly, we have something called topic modeling, which uh, is a little bit deeper in natural language understanding and natural language processing. But essentially what this means is trying to establish a hierarchy or a tree of relationships between different objects, verbs, um, predicates, and, and so on from your text. So try and ascertain some more metadata about that. Uh, so again, what this looks like, you can be able to pull data from sources like your own, uh, let's say, internal documents or emails. You can pull data from social media, uh, text messages, what have you, reviews on, on, on public websites. And you can feed that all into Comprehend. And you can get everything from the entities to the key phrases to the language. Uh, for a restaurant, it may not just be valuable to hear that people are happy about your product. They may want to hear exactly what the types of food that uh, they're being served, that they're talking about a lot, that are making them happy. Conversely, it's not just about understanding if all of the text is broadly mixed, negative, or positive. Uh, a restaurant or a company that makes a given product may be really interested in hearing that when customers talk about product A, they're really happy, but when they talk about B, they're really disappointed or upset. This sort of nuance is something that would be really hard to build on your own, but again, we provide all of the uh, you know, necessary data and metadata as a result of Comprehend for you to be able to build applications that use that. 
So again, understanding the voice of the customer, being able to perform some sort of smart search functionality, uh, and then lastly, actually being able to manage your data and, and make it actionable, right? Your data that sits in a database is really nice, but you don't want to have to bug your DBA to um, get access to it. With Comprehend, it enables you to actually set up things like custom dashboards through maybe Elasticsearch or QuickSight to be able to enable more parts of your organization to use this data. Okay, so understanding the voice of your customer is something that it transcends most industries. Um, it entails all of the services I just talked about, and it, it, it sort of gets into everything from sentiment analysis to making blog posts more accessible by translating and vocalizing them. And there's lots of really exciting customers that use this. Okay, so bringing it all together, I, I mentioned before that you can let other people in your organization use this. I won't dwell too long on this, but this is an example where you can take real-time data from, let's say, the Twitter streaming API. You can pull it in with Kinesis, Firehose, translate it from one language, understand the sentiment, store it in S3, and then query and visualize it using Athena and Amazon QuickSight dashboards. This is going to essentially be an entire end-to-end -end serverless example for multi-language inputs. Um, and you can even transcribe data from phone calls and audio and, and conglomerate that all within the same S3 bucket. Uh, you have a lot of options here, uh, but ultimately the point I want to bring home here is that you get to spend time thinking about how you want to solve this problem and make your data valuable, and we figure out, uh, you can figure out what to do with it, and we figure out how to make it possible by offering these really exciting AI services. Okay, so really quickly, improving contact centers with AI. We have something called Amazon Connect. It enables you to essentially have a contact center as a service. So with that, customers can call in. Those recordings can be dumped to S3. You can use AWS step functions to then call a sequence of different commands. Uh, for example, transcribe the audio from them, uh, from someone that calls in, and then understand the sentiment with comprehend. You may want to understand the entities, the phrases, the sentiments. Output that to S3 somewhere. Uh, and then based on the, the contact trace record or the CTR, uh, we can then put those things together, uh, pair them with S3, and then visualize that in an insight or a dashboard. Again, lots of different options to make your data valuable to you. So here's a video that showcases what this looks like. And this is going to use all of the different APIs to build uh, you know, a very complex contact center that uh, essentially just uses a, a simple web application How where all of the back end is powered by the having. AWS AI services. Hi, Nikki. Uh, so we can see here the customer, customer is um, going to call in. And we see that in real time, the customer's words are going to be transcribed here in the box using the Amazon Transcribe Streaming API. Uh, then in real time, we can translate this by feeding that data uh, iteratively into the Amazon, Amazon Translate uh, API as well. So we see that coming in on the lower box. Uh, we can select, in this example, we have a selection box down at the bottom of the target language. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we can actually take, by extracting the key entities using Amazon Comprehend, we can both get the sentiment, which shows in the uh, emoji or the, the neutral smiley face uh, up ahead, but also on the right-hand side, we may have extracted certain um, entities or certain common patterns where suggested actions are paired to those, where the, the customer service representative can quickly look on the right-hand side to help them more easily resolve this uh, without having to you know, start from scratch, essentially, with each given customer. Again, from end to end, this is something that would be either completely manual or a very uh, long and, and difficult process, but all of the different uh, APIs enable this to, to be very possible. So uh, a big part of uh, what can power this going forward is something called Amazon Lex. So it's a conversational interface that enables you to uh, essentially build chatbots. Uh, and this is using the same technology that underpins the Amazon Alexa. Uh, so we have lots of different parts of this entire end-to-end -end pipeline. Some of them are very common to traditional software deployments, and others are going to be uh, very unique to this particular use case, especially around uh, transcription of the text and, and natural language understanding, dialogue management, and so on. But again, as a managed service, it handles all of this, and you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure. So you can easily build out contact flows where you define certain uh, intense utterances all through the GUI if you don't really want to use the SDK to be able to do this. And it helps you more easily visualize how these conversations may flow. So an example of what this really looks like when we look at the core entities, we have things called intents, uh, which is what the uh, the from a given piece of user uh, text, what is the true intent of that passage? So can we suss out particular verbs or queries from that that we are designing our chatbot to be able to respond to? 
Next, utterances are going to be uh, phrases that trigger that. So if you, if you um, let's say for example, you tell your Alexa to play, and then you pass it in a, a given, um, like a song name, the uh, utterance would be to uh, either in typed or spoken form to play audio. Uh, slots are going to be what that parameter or that variable will be. So in the song example, it would be um, what the song name is or the artist or the album. Uh, and then lastly will be fulfillment, which will be, okay, well once we've paired an utterance to a, uh, and, and a slot, uh, well, what do we do with that data? How do we resolve the user's request and then hopefully move on to something else? This is a diagram of what this can look like uh, with respect to leveraging Lex to you know, build a serverless chatbot with Lambda, all of the components that are really bundled into it. It's a lot, it would be really difficult to build on your own, but again, the idea is that if you want a chatbot service, Amazon Lex will help you handle that from end to end. Use cases, uh, I think they're fairly straightforward here in this example. Again, everything from automating a contact center, giving information to customers in an easy to use format, uh, servicing information requests internally or organization for an enterprise productivity tool, um, or even you know, IoT devices that can run in a completely serverless fashion uh, with respect to the chatbot without needing to have heavy compute to perform machine learning at edge uh, to have a chatbot working. Okay, so again, if you work, regardless of industry, you probably have call centers. You probably want to improve your customer service and make things quicker uh, and cheaper to run your, your, your call center sort of infrastructure, even if it's virtualized. Uh, so with putting AI to work for your business, we have a few other use cases. Another one would be personalizing customer experiences. We see this as something that's very valuable. You want Users don't want to be all safe, served the exact same experience. You want to be able to tailor uh, content showing to your viewers that will translate in better conversion or better retention of those given users. And these are the services, these are the services that will allow you to do that. Uh, the core one here is Amazon Personalized. So based on a, this is an API that based on a series of actions and user behavior data, you can pass this into Personalized and it will manage the entirety of the training infrastructure around this and will automatically deploy and manage the infrastructure to serve requests. Again, it's just an API. So even though you may pass in a URL for the data set in the format of your data uh, in S3, to personalize, then all of the inferences are done by specifying what that given model's ID is. And again, completely managed so you don't have to manage any of this. It works in real time, you're building your own custom models, and even though you get to use your own data, you don't have to manage any of the underlying infrastructure. Uh, as an Amazon AWS managed API, this will actually scale up to any number of requests that you may need, so concurrency will not be a problem. An example of using this is going to be similar to Textract or many of the other examples I had before, where you may have a given, um, you know, you have your, in this example that's unique, you have your signups, you have your data, you have your past information that you want to actually create your campaign or your model for. Uh, you pass those into Personalized and it will come up with that Personalized Recommendation API specific to your data set. Um, and now it does a lot under the hood. Um, th there is a lot that you know. Maybe you're interested in SageMaker. Maybe you're interested in optimizing across a lot of these different fields. We have again figured that out for this particular use case. Um, but you know, this is all abstracted away, and I, I listed here so that you have an idea of what you don't have to do when you want to implement AI and machine learning for something as often complicated as, as uh, personalizations. Domino's does this uh, for really interesting uh, feature sets. So it actually enables them to serve custom sales and recommendations and coupons to customers based on what uh, their past behavior is and hopefully increasing conversions um, for, their, for their given customers so that they end up spending more money and buying more, more pizza and more products. Lastly, time series forecasting. You have past data that follows some sort of numerical trend, but you don't know what that trend is and you want to be able to predict going forward. Everything from inventory to utilization on some of your resources, let's say. With Amazon Forecast, you can actually pass in this data and similar to Personalize, have it automatically train a model for you, host the infrastructure, and you can uh, send new data to that to be able to ascertain what the prediction will be for that numerical data going forward. Again, historical data, everything from supply quantities uh, to, to the costs of certain goods and so on. And the output, again, is a custom API just for you. These are all the steps that are optimized, very similar to personalize. Um, common use cases here are going to be like retail demand, travel demand, web traffic. Uh, again, this is something that's often relegated to data scientists or uh, you know, statisticians. Uh, but Again, leveraging the power of this API, AWS's uh, ML engineers have you covered, and you can start using this in production uh, with on the free tier, essentially no cost uh, early on, depending on your number of requests. OK, so I know I'm running long, but I have a very quick demo to showcase uh, each of these given services. So 
Uh, I have a website that's actually hosted live, and you can go and check it out to see all of these demos. So it's ai-service-demos.go-aws.com. Again, this is live, and you can go check it out and try it out with data that you may see in production. So if the AI services are interesting to you, but you want to maybe dive deeper or uh, understand a feature set we may not have talked about today, we have lots of ways to be able to do that. Uh, if, if one of those services that I mentioned today doesn't cover your use case, you're probably going to be looking at Amazon SageMaker. Uh, again, this builds on top of all of the primitives below it, but it is a platformized end-to-end -end solution that enables you to build, train, and deploy your own machine learning model at scale without needing an ML PhD because lots of those uh, powerful algorithms and models are optimized and included by default with the SageMaker SDK. If you want to dig a little bit deeper into some of the education or the materials that we use, we have lots of those available here. Everything from the materials we use to train uh, software engineers on machine learning here at Amazon and AWS, um, but also structured courses and specialist certifications for machine learning and AI to help you, uh, you know, prove yourself in the AI and machine learning space and, and be equipped to handle and use these services. So I talked about a lot of services today. I know there are, uh, it can seem overwhelming. Here is all of them again. You can get started today. Many of these services are covered under generous free tiers that could be everything from you know, hundreds or thousands of minutes or, or characters transcribed up to uh, you know, let's say millions of uh, you know, like translations per month, something regarding, regarding whatever your, your data structure size may be. There's lots of generous free tiers. Check out each of the given uh, pages in the console and on the documentation. And that is going to be it for me. I know that was a lot. There are a lot of AI services, and they're all really exciting. But I'm glad you stuck through it with me. If you'd like to talk more about AI services or any, honestly anything AWS related, feel free to ping me on Twitter. I'm slash the, uh, at the Nick Walsh, or email me at the email address listed there. Thank you for tuning into my talk, and have a great time at reInvent.